Nah, we're started. It was good. It saves like in the cloud. Hey, everybody. This is Everything Vive. And I we've got like an incredible treat for everybody that likes video games or VR or reading or knowledge in any way, shape, or form. Blake J. Harris. He is the author of two phenomenal books. Uh, the first one being... I know when I have I have cool neat little things here. Let's see if I have my banners or my brand or all this stuff. The first one, Console Wars, very fancy. Uh, the Sega Nintendo and the battle that defined a generation. If you ever played a video game in your life, you should read this book. Forward by Seth Rog Rogen and Evan Goldberg. I want to hear the story of how that all went down. Um, and amazing book. And then a second book, which is really why it kind of came to the attention of the show, uh, History of the Future. Oculus, Facebook, and the revolution that swept virtual reality. Blake J. Harris, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, the real treat, I'm, I'm pretty boring, but the real treat is you promised me uh, dad jokes, so I, I think that's what, uh, that's I what I'm here for. Them. I got a bunch All of right. them, and I, I, my, my daughters don't laugh at them, and I guarantee you probably not laugh <laughs> at them, too. A lot of puns. Um, oh, no, thanks puns. for thank you for coming puns. on the show. Like I said, I'm a I'm a big fan of the books. Uh, I'm an old school uh, classic gamer. I, I'm forty four something years old, so I lived through the late seventies arcade games, uh, the 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 death kind of arcade games in the eighty, you know, the mid eighties, the eighty three, the crash, and then resurgence of I played. You know, I had I've had every game system there is, and then now we've got this amazing thing like the second rebirth of VR and all that stuff. So. I've been in it a long time, and and I'm trying to think how I came across uh, knowing about your books. I'm sure I yeah, saw I, a, a post somewhere. I saw somebody. It was probably it was Console Wars was the first one I read, and I probably, I think I just read like an article or something in some some big time newspaper online or something. And they're like, this book is if you same kind of thing. If you've ever played a video game, uh, you got to read this book. And what's crazy about Console Wars is there's so much information in it that your average gamer or just person doesn't even never even heard about just all these crazy infighting stories and everything. But I, I want to start it off right and really kind of get to the writing. You're an author. You've written two amazing books. Have you written, have you written more? I'm sure you've written more. Have you written more of for those books? And these were just the two things that kind of like were the biggest things or how does that work? Oh no. Uh, well, first off, thanks for the very kind words and we'll get into it more, but like as much as I, uh, you know, I'm confident in my writing abilities, both books, I think are, both books are amazing, but it's 95% because the people I'm writing about, like, you know, yeah. it's, it, their stories are so fascinating that it's, you know, I, I, it's wise to pick those stories, but like, it was just my job not to mess it up. But no, um, so, so my quick backstory is, um, I went to college in, in DC at, I, at some point during college, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. I had no idea how to do that for a living, how to monetize that. Um, so after college for the next eight years, like literally until the day of my 30th birthday, I had a day job trading commodities for Brazilian clients, like sugar and coffee and soybeans, mm -hmm. um, I worked with seven Portuguese speakers. Um, and I was writing on the side. I was mostly doing, I was almost, I think I was only doing screenwriting, like uh, spec TV shows and spec yeah, cool. films. Um, yeah. So no books, not even any like articles. Um, right. And then I had a really, a really big disappointment, which I guess was in hindsight a good thing, a defining moment. Uh, one of the scripts that I wrote uh, with my writing partner Jonah Tulis, we wrote this script about a dictator of a small European country uh, that was, I think, the best script uh, that we've ever written. It was quite funny. And then the like the week that we finished it before we went to the market with it. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen announced that he was doing a dictator movie, and so our script totally oh, became yeah. worthless. Oh yeah. no, man! And, you know, I, yeah, I've heard of that happening before, where it was like, yeah, two, two, three things that kind of all coalesce. That is, oh, yeah, and so like, uh, and like, and like, that, that's exactly the. I wasn't. I realized I, I wasn't the first person this happened to. That it was probably going to yeah. happen to me other times in my life, and so my takeaway, you know, initially I was very upset, and I thought, oh, you know, screw what this. Year, what, year stop this? what year is this? What year? What year is this? The, the that, dictator? that would have been like 2010. 2010 uh, it was okay. like before it was even a production. So it was like, you know, I had oh, yeah. Jonah and I had spent six months writing a script. We had a script that our representative thought was good. But because Sasha Baron Cohen had this idea, they hadn't even written the script yet. Like ours instantly became worthless. And I understood like that makes sense. If I was a producer, I would much rather make a movie by Sasha Baron Cohen, who's done this great, all this great stuff. 
um, yeah. as opposed to like something by Blake and Jonah, who I've never heard of. And so uh, after I got past being upset, my uh, <clears throat> my main takeaway was um, I'm never going to stop writing. I'm probably never going to make a living doing it, but I love it. And so I should just write things that I really, really love. I had always wanted to write books. That was initially what I thought I would do. Um, and so I uh, actually, before I even wrote Console Wars, I wanted to just read a book that was about Sega Nintendo uh, because my brother had got me a Sega Genesis for my birthday, like when I was 28, when I, some, you know, 28 or 29. And, uh, and I, went, I remember going to, and since I like, you know, my favorite books to read, all the, the books on the shelf beside me are like behind the scenes business stories. I, I went to Barnes and Noble yeah. on 86th Street in New York. And I just, and I remember asking the woman at the information desk for one of the books on Sega and Nintendo, assuming that there would be like several. And, uh, and I also, I looked for a video game history section and there was no such thing. I thought, you know, next to the film history shockingly, section. Music shockingly history. at Barnes and Noble, shockingly, the, the video game uh, history section is a little thin. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, That's cool. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah. I didn't know a ton about the industry at the time, but you yeah. think, or the, the 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 game industry is bigger than film industry and music industry combined, and they both have these big Like sections. exponentially, right. exponentially. Yeah. More. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and so I was just kind of shocked. I remember, you know, whenever you go to the information desk, especially back then when it was sort of a transition between uh, brick and mortar stores and online hadn't fully, fully taken off. I mean, that, that, yeah. obviously I was always big, but like, you know, they usually try to sell you something like, oh, well, we, have, we this book's not in stock, but we can order it for you. They didn't even try to do that. No, they just no, said, I'm sorry, sorry, we don't have any books like that. Yeah, no, there was no book about video games or video game history. The business wonder why they didn't. Been, yeah, it's a wonder why they didn't take over the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so like, you know, the only thing they had in the entire three story Barnes and Noble was walkthrough guides. Um, and so I can't say that I left Barnes and Noble that day thinking like, aha, here's a, a demand that I'm going to provide the supply for. It wasn't like that, yeah. but it did make me think like, well, that's very weird. Um, and then I did end up discovering some video game books that were out there that were great. You know, I'm not curious. It wasn't like I was the first person to write a book about video games. Stephen yeah, yeah. Kent wrote an incredible oral history slash narration uh, book called The uh, Ultimate History of Video Games for the First Quarter. David yeah, Schaff wrote a book uh, yeah, about good. Nintendo um, called Game Over that I always sort of saw as like my book was like a sequel to that because his mm -hmm. so his book was the only his book was the only book that was actually like the kinds of books I liked the behind the scenes business stories where you get to know the people and really sort of get inside their head and it was more business focused than character focused like the kind of writing I do but at least it was like what I wanted but it was from Nintendo's perspective it talked about how they had resurrected the game industry in the 80s and then it's it, the book came out in 1992 or 1993 but sort of the end of the book was like uh, you know, there's a scrappy upstart Sega, but who knows yeah, yeah. what the future holds with the multimedia and CD-ROMs coming. And I was like, this is, it was just about to get exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just gonna, just getting good. And then it was like, oh, yeah. we'll see. Uh, I guess Nintendo will rule the whole world forever. The end. Yeah, it did sort of end like that. It, like, there was, I think the second to last chapter was on Sega and how they like got rid of the threat. And it was like, whoa, no, no they didn't. Um, well, there'll only so, be two players in this yeah. space forever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um and, uh, and so I, I, I uh, you know, read everything I could on the subject matter. I was shocked by how little had been published and also just how little was out there. You know, there was a really good, the, like the only even like history of Sega that I could find. Um, later I found Sam Pettis' book. Um, but the only history that sort of chronicled the 16-bit era, the 8-bit era, was like there was a good, uh, really nice history on IGN by a kid named Travis Foz, who ended up actually helping connect me with Tom Kalinske. Um, and, and, and just sort of like getting back to what you opened up with saying that there's like all these incredible stories that, that people had never heard of before that gamers had never heard before. Like that's how I felt researching and doing the interviews. Like I just was shocked the whole time that no one had done this before me. And it was like a project, uh, quite unlike the, the history of the future, uh, yeah. where with console words, I woke up every day and I was like really excited to work. Cause I was like, what am I going to learn yeah. today? What's the yeah, new what fun crazy, thing? Yeah. What crazy stuff. Cause every other sector of the tech industry since edison has got these amazing stories about this like ibm just about ruled the world and then you know bill gates and steve Ballmer came along and kind of just like took it away and it's this incredible story the biggest fortune ever made and then steve jobs is the king of the universe and and owns his own company and then kicked out and then comes back to save there's just this constant kind of like amazing uh stories that are in tech and then the like you said the largest entertainment money maker of anything is video games right. and we have nothing there's no I mean, before your books there just there was very little very, very little there still is very yeah. little 
and, and something I'll say at the end of the show, but, you know, if there's anyone out there who's watching, who's listening, that is interested in writing a book, uh, you know, uh, like, and, and you think I might be able to help or, you know, you just mm -hmm. want to bounce ideas off me, feel free to reach out because I'm a big, uh, I want there to be more books about the history of video games and the business yeah, of video exactly. games. So exactly. I can help make that happen. Let me know. Uh, that's phenomenal. I, I think that's, I, I, I think that's maybe a misconception about authors is that maybe they're not that they're closed off, but like, if you have a question, and you reach out to an author, they just want to. They just want to tell you, like, this is what I know. Like, here you go. You you write these books and you put all this information in. I, of all people, I think authors. That's kind of a common thread and everything. So that's pretty. Uh, that's cool. generally that's been my cool. experience too. I mean, because like, uh, I mean, look, this is my dream job. This is exactly what I want to be doing. But like, you know, it's a lot of uh, time alone. So when you when yeah. someone reaches out to you and actually has wants to have a good faith argument or actually has some. Thing, yeah, interesting to say it's uh it's usually a welcome uh, respite from the rest of the day what um, uh, what are their common yeah. do, when you get questions like that what, like my questions would be like i don't know like how did you get how did you get published how did you get how did you get that all all those uh those gears going how because it seems like that online people are constantly like uh, i wrote something and i how did how do you get published and yeah, then I mean, too, I get, like like like, like yeah. Two, there's, I mean, there'd be like two genres of questions that I usually would get asked with regards to publishing. One is like the business side, like how did you get the book published, or how did you get an agent, or how, or what, what does a book proposal look like? What, like, how, what is that process like? And then I get questions about like the creative process, like, like how did you write the book? Like, did, like, did you outline it? Did you interview exactly. people first? Like yeah, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it, it like I, as I found over the years. It, not just with the writing of the books, but just with the stuff I'm writing about, whether it's Oculus or Sega or anything mm -hmm. else, it's like just helping to organize the information. So yeah. I, I think everyone knows that there would be two parts to the book process of the creative side and the business side, but just sort of streamlining it like, all right, let's focus on the business right mm -hmm. now, or let's focus on the side of the creative just helps um, make it less uh, intimidating because it, it was intimidating for me. I, I didn't yeah. have any friends or know anyone who had published a book before. And that's also why I want to be helpful because I wish that I had someone that I could sort of just go to and ask these questions too, and I didn't really have that yeah. time, so I'm trying to be provide that. I think that's common. Like I, I, I don't know anybody. You're the first person that I really actually. I mean, I've I've talked to authors, nice. but but it's not that common. I mean, there's a lot more like attorneys and dentists and stuff than there is people that have successfully published a real book. So yeah, that's that's huge. Um, and then you get done. Well, first talk about maybe a little bit about your method of writing i know everybody has different ways of doing it a lot of people it's it's like you write a little bit every day i know in screenplay writing they're like you gotta hammer out if you get four pages a day or three pages a day if you can stick to it you're gonna finish you're gonna finish the first draft but how how do you what's your method like what's your process uh yeah i mean for everyone it's different and also for myself it's kind of different um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not the kind of person who has like a set time, like every day from 7am to 9am, I do this or that. Uh, I, I, I usually tackle each day separately or, you know, sort of plan the night before what I want to do. Um, but what I've found, uh, in a lot of ways, console wars was like me figuring this stuff out. Uh, you know, the history of the future was much more aside from how long it took. It was much more of like the process that I've been carrying out going forward with my third book now. Um, but but I guess what I found works really well for me uh, is 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 a few things. Uh, I think that what I do well, or at least what I like to write, is is character driven stories. So it's uh, a story where you actually feel like you're in the room and often in the heads with these people who are making the things happen. So with Oculus, that was often Palmer Lucky or his co-founders Brendan Areeb and Nate Mitchell and Mike Antonoff, and at Sega it was Tom Kalinske and Al Nilsson and Ellen Beth Van Buskirk, and so. For, to, in order to be able to do that um, and to do it honestly and and have that information, it's 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 all you know. It's getting that access to those people and developing the relationship with those people is critical. So that's a big part of my process. Um, I also, uh, you know, I, I I like to collect as much information as possible before I actually get to the writing phase. Uh, so as you know, sort of, I often think of like a cooking analogy, though it's not a very interesting one, but just, you know, collecting all the ingredients. And then after I have the ingredients, figuring out what to make, as opposed to, you know, I, I want to delay the decision of what to make for as long as possible, because um, the longer, I mean, maybe I'm just a slacker, but also like, uh, you know, I'll have a much better idea of what I can make once I know yeah. which ingredients I have. 
Um, That's interesting. So you my said, process in, is like, in reverse, kind of in reverse. Like I'm going to get all this stuff together. I don't know where it's going, but I know what I kind of want to get to. That's cool. Yeah, because like a, like a, a good example um, from the history of the future that always stands out to me is like, okay, I guess I should begin by saying both my books are 500 pages and both of them are still just the tip of the iceberg. You know, like there's so yeah. much that's not in, in these stories. There's so many people that aren't even in the stories. I try to make it but as ensemble as possible. It's a quick, it sounds funny, but it's a, it's, it's a quick read because the way you write it, it's, it's, it, you feel like you're there. Like when it's Palmer and Herve and, and they're at like some either nightclub or whatever, they're out having dinner or whatever. You feel like you're at the table. It's told in such a Good. way, and it, that, I, you that, know what I mean. That's, that's cool. what's so cool about like, it, and that's why it, that's why it's fast. It, it feels like it's a lot quicker, uh, and that's really you're just nice in to it. Well, it's that's just how Is it that, feels. Well, like I, uh, I, I, I realized very early on when writing console wars that I want my goal with all of my storytelling, or especially my book writing, to be uh, my ideal reader is my grandmother. So how can I get her to care about the story? And the okay. answer is making it exciting making it universal so it's not just you know she doesn't care about the the, the latency in vr but she will care if it's if, if the people in the scene care and you give and, and you make it accessible and sort of a yeah. universal struggle of like how do we accomplish this thing or how do you accomplish this thing when two people yeah. think it's one way and someone mm -hmm. else thinks it's another way or a console war stores with tom kalinsky in a beach in hawaii getting offered a job and we've all been in a situation where we've been offered jobs maybe not on the beach in hawaii um but. so so, so like the in the end, I came to realize that the plotting is really the most important thing uh, to my work, and uh, and so and and the, what I was getting at in the long winded way before was like the reason I like to collect so as much as possible is because you know you're not you, you, you can never tell the full story unless you had twenty four seven surveillance cameras of every character in the story. Exactly. Um, exactly. But like I want to tell a story that's representative, and so you have to oftentimes you know find examples. That are entertaining and interesting in their own right, but and and also have stakes within the story, but but also give you uh, sort of convey a larger meaning about how something is changing. And the example that that I'm thinking of is uh you know uh, Chris Galizzi from Hyperkin in the History of the Future. He was working with Oculus early on to make a uh, peripheral device, uh you know a, a gun to be used for virtual reality, and he uh, by all accounts uh, it, it was doing a great job, um, and then. That project ended up being killed once Oculus sold to Facebook because Facebook didn't want to have anything to do with guns. And whether or not that's a decision you agree with, that just yeah, seems yeah. like symbolic of Oculus is no longer the same company. They're no longer their number one priority is not appealing to gamers. That's still a big priority. But you know that example yeah. just showed me like that. And there was another example in like, in console wars that I, I always think of as sort of like the, the perfect example of what I would try to accomplish uh, with the with the blowfish, the the fugu, the the. It's like you know the fish from this where if you, if it's cut wrong and you it's poisonous and you could die. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So there's that scene in console wars where Al Pan and uh, the, the people at Sega of Japan suggest that he try the fugu and uh, it's very dangerous and Al does so without an issue and then when he says to them like all right your turn to try it they're they're too uh, reticent and scared to try it and that's sort of indicative of the risk appetite for Sega of America versus Sega of Japan because for people who don't know. Um, you know, in, in America, Sega was very, you know, very successful 16-bit era at one point, Super Nintendo at the least, that there was room for more than one company in the space, whereas in Japan, 16-bit era uh, was very unsuccessful, never really having more than 15% of the market. So part of the book was like a case study of like, why was Sega yeah. with the same exact products, the same exact game successful in America, but not in Japan? Well, and they were pretty, like their marketing was very edgy compared to Nintendo, which was very right. like family friendly and, and and still to this day but sega was very like in your face like it was a it was a very ed, like like edgy kind of thing and like rock and roll nirvana like it was it was a it was a grunge kind of thing going on with sega in the early 90s Definitely. And, totally yeah. that and us versus you know, them and, and they had crazy advertisements they had like half naked girl like with like a mohawk and like just crazy crazy stuff i'm i'm not i'm pulling out my butt but they had some wild no, but you're, you're not wrong and like marketing part of the fun game. of the book is seeing where that marketing comes from you know as a kid i of course never thought about where it came from but then as an yeah. adult you think like yeah that's crazy stuff quick cuts like are yeah. people just throwing stuff against the wall and then you actually see that there was a so much thought process that went into it and like a you know just one example was uh, they did focus groups with kids and realized that kids were so much more literate with watching video and television than adults. So that um, 
Sega couldn't afford. So Sega couldn't afford to do like 30 second commercials or minute long commercials like Nintendo. So they did 15 second commercials, but they had as much content because they did quick cuts. And they really, yeah, they boom, said, boom, boom. they thought adults can't keep up with this, but kids can actually figure out, they yeah. can follow along. And so they were appealing to kids a, and a to pull, young teens. A, so. more of a, a pull strategy where they're pulling the, the games through the parents, through the kids versus Nintendo. Yes. It's like, it's like like an old Nintendo guy, like, hey, folks, get this for your kids. They'll love you more. Like that, it was a very right. different kind of yeah feeling between the. the and and, and, and also, I, I would add like to what you're saying because that's totally true. That was the case. It was like ultimately what made console, what made the battle between Sega and Nintendo so interesting, and what made the book uh, so compelling and interesting to write was that there was just this different uh, philosophical approach to to selling games. Uh, Nintendo, it was all about the game itself. It was about the product. And so they, it didn't matter who the messenger was, if it was saying, hey, kids, try this, or if it was yeah. a cool guy saying, hey, kids, try this. All they said was they, their, their perspective in a nutshell was, if you like this game, play it. But that's not yeah. in a lot of life. Marketing changes the way that you experience a game. And so so yeah. the, 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 the short version of what I'm trying to say is that uh, there was sort of a, a style versus substance battle um, which, and, and and those are the best kinds of battles as a as an author to tell because I can see it from both sides. I, you know, one of my favorite parts was uh, I guess to back up quickly. When I first started working on the book, I sort of assumed that so much time had passed between the console wars in the '90s that people from Sega and Nintendo would have like sort of a Magic Johnson, Larry Bird perspective of each other. Like, you know, we're rivals, but we're pushing each other to new heights, and I really respect that. But that's not the case, yeah. actually. Almost all the people from Sega still hate the Nintendo people because they think they were bullies, <laughs> and all the people from Nintendo think the Sega people were They're frauds. still salty. They're still salty yeah. about it. That's great. Yeah. I didn't. I would never think that. Really that. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, I I didn't think that. Yeah, you'd think they'd be all like reserved and like, oh, yeah, they're 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 good. They're smart people. There was there was really not a time <laughs> from either company, you know, because we also did a documentary that's going to be coming out and like. Sometimes they'll say some complimentary things to the other one, but even when they give a comp, when Sega employee gives a comp to Nintendo employee or vice versa, there's always a passive aggressive nature to it. There's yeah. always an undercurrent. They didn't, didn't suck like, 100%. Well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they that's really fun to be in the <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Um, but one thing about, and, I, and I'm trying to think if you talked about, like Nintendo for a long time was underdogs. They came into it as underdog, like Nintendo of America it's what 82 or 83 the just just right at when it when atari flooded the market and there was this huge implosion of arcade and console games and every toy buyer out there was like i, I if you have it like if you if you try to sell a video game it's over like they don't even want to talk to you you would go to toy conventions and right. all this kind of stuff and you were just it was shut down immediately and nintendo was having a hard time they had a great product they had a, just it was amazing but nobody wanted to touch it and they couldn't they couldn't buy any influence and they underdogs and then they come in and then they take over and they're the kings and and that's what's so crazy and then they've constantly kind of relived this over and over again where they they're the underdogs again and here they come again and then great games great stuff and then rabid fan base and they they've kind of done this over and over again it's funny right. and then they come out the week it's, 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 it's over and over yeah, I mean, and, and for, as a storyteller, that's great that, like, you know, ultimately the story of Sega versus Nintendo is the story of a David Goliath underdog story. You know, the, the, the nutshell version is that Sega had less than 5% of the market in 1990 and ended up at one point having 60% of the market and surpassing Nintendo by 1993. And then sort of it's Blue. a rise and fall story. But, Blue but you know, to, to think that just five years earlier, Nintendo was their own David in the David Goliath story of exactly as you're describing – um, yeah. And then that also gets to why I like the character driven approach, because when I first talked to people, they would say, oh, you know, Nintendo was an underdog or, you know, no, no toy buyer or nobody at the electronic stores would want to carry a Nintendo product. And I just sort of think, like, is that really true? And then I talked to the salesmen who actually went like who's who needed to feed their families by selling Nintendo and they would go to these stores and they would they would they they couldn't even, you know, give what their pitch. The, yeah. The, the, yeah, the sellers didn't want to do with it. I, mean, I know that sounds kind of crazy given, as we've alluded no, to, how no, big the industry totally. is. But, they had to make the rob, like, right? They had to make the rob just right. to trick, to to trick Sears Robot yeah. into thinking this was a toy. Oh, it's a toy. Don't uh, jokes up the TV, but it's a totally it's a toy, fun robot. It's fun and fun. Kids will love it. It's a toy. Electronics. Don't look at the TV. It's just a, yeah. They, it was total right. trick, total scam. It's funny, that's a marketing thing, too. That's a marketing gimmick to basically say, yeah, like, yeah. 
it doesn't really ha- help the games, but it, it, it makes it different because, you know, a big part of the problem was that people with their Ataris or ColecoVisions or whatever console they had and television back in the pre-internet days, you didn't really know what you were buying. Like I remember going to a, uh, a mall with my family and you know the only the only way that my brother and i would ever get a game is like for a birthday or for hanukkah or something but this yeah. was like a special occasion my parents said okay we'll buy you a game and it was oh my god and our entire criteria for determining which game we wanted was just the back of the box so yeah. people were spending yeah, 50 it. 60 dollars you didn't know what you were getting and, yeah. and the quality of the of the software was terrible and nintendo was thought that they had better software and they could I, resurrect the market and they did i it was 30 bucks for for in television for burger time and I, I got I was on a two dollar allowance per week, so for fifteen weeks I saved up two dollar. And and the only reason I like Burger Time is because the commercial was funny. It had this chef running around and all the like the the hot dogs were chasing him and stuff. And that was it. I was like, okay, this could be cool. And thirty bucks, I take it in, I flop it down, and I, I mean, I probably wore the contact pins on the game out. I played it so much on a television, but yeah, the back of the box. Well, you look at the back of the box. And- I like I like also to give some context too for like. It wasn't just that the sake of people thought Nintendo were bullies because they were the enemy, but like a good example is so what was so one way that you and I could have avoided that fate because I had the similar experience with Qbert, which I was just terrible at. So I had like saved up so much money for this game that I couldn't even play because I'm so bad. Yeah. You, you know, one way you could avoid that is by renting is by renting the game. So you spend five dollars or ten dollars and play it for a weekend and see if you like it. But Nintendo um, sued. Uh, Blockbuster and mom and pop stores to prevent them from letting that happen, and they their reasoning uh, is understandable. Like they, they, that's not how their content was supposed to be used. Um, yeah. So they were very controlling, and in their opinion, they were doing the right thing. But like that was just, that was the sort of why people thought Nintendo was bully, and there's, there were antitrust laws yeah, yeah. against them. So that's crazy. So and there's was, not there wasn't a lot of yeah. Nintendo games that you could even remotely finish in two days, if, even if you played it for t- like. 12 hours straight like those nintendo games like zelda if, if you rented zelda for two nights you're getting late fees because man but that was probably no that was that would be part of their thinking is like yeah from their perspective they would say well if you only play it for two nights you're gonna have a bad experience because you're not going to be able to finish it because our games yeah, are so yeah. deep and complex that so you need yeah, to exactly. be able to spend all the time so <laughs> whether you agree or not that was a strategy and that's then there's funny. you know that, yeah that's funny um so I mean, I, I like I said, I, I'm a I'm a big I, I'm a big classic gamer. I I I used to work. I worked at Software Etc. God, when did I start working at Software Etc.? Like, like wow. mid '90s, probably like '93. I remember Software Etc. very well. Uh, that was it. That was my jam. Oh well, I was a kid. I worked at a movie theater for a year, and then and then I was like, I want money, and I want to do. I want to play video games, and so. Well, what were the was, hot games? at the time when you were working at software, et cetera, like what was the console and what were people playing at that time? So there was a little bit of everything on computer side. There was like alone in the dark lemmings, uh, was a big thing. Wolfenstein, but Wolfenstein wasn't really sold in the stores. It was like a shareware only right. kind of thing, yeah. but that, that's what people came and asked for. Like you have Wolfenstein, like, no, you can only get it, you know, for free on a BBS or something. Um, I'm trying to think really software, et cetera. It started booming and lots of people were coming in on the consoles. When like Mortal Kombat was coming out, and the Sega started getting really popular, um, and then yeah, really started that 3D, or not 3D, but the uh, the 16-bit era, uh, Secret of Mana. That's when things started just like boom, 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 boom. Um, and then I remember when 3DO came out, and we had a 3DO <laughs> in our store. Yeah. Man, I wore that thing out, um, and that kind of blew people's minds until you told them the price, right? And, Across the street from the where I worked was an arcade, which of course I became best friends with the manager of the arcade, so you get free credits. But yeah, that's my total motivation as a teenager was was just where can I go play video games and get paid for it and just talk to people about video games all day. I played everything. That was the really cool thing. I I played you. You could just take it home and play it as long as you want, and then bring it back and wrap it up and shrink wrap, and then they would just sell it to somebody, and you just talk video (laughs) games. You just and you learn to like even stuff. Even stuff you had no interest in, you're like, what do I care? I'll go play it. I don't care. But yeah, early PC stuff, the 90s PC stuff, I was, I, I did all of the, I did, I mean, I played everything. Um, it, really weird things, really weird, obscure type games. I'm going back with my kids now and I built a Pentium 100 and showing them all the old stuff. And it's surprising what they, 
what they actually latch on to and really enjoy. What kind of stuff are they enjoying? Well, my oldest, don't tell mom, but I let her play Doom, but you know, whatever. Uh, my oldest is nine and she, she plays, she likes some of the older stuff like Out of This World, which is a big, big fan of a big game that I like. Um, she likes, my six year old likes uh, Jill of the Jungle. She'll play that for all day. Uh, and then my four, I have four girls. And then my four year old likes Fatty Bear, of course. So we play a lot of the Fatty Bears, Birthday Surprise, and all this. Full Throttle, I get the kids to play all the LucasArts stuff. So Secret of Monkey Island, they play mm-hmm. that. Um, and then I have one, and, then my, and the, the youngest is 21 months. And I haven't got her playing PC games, but I get her on the cabinet. I've got a, a stand up cabinet so the kids can play stuff. I, I'm wow. big on teaching kids the classics. So my kids learn the classics first. Very good play, father. That's. I try. I mean, I've got a I've got a cocktail that plays a lot of old school stuff. So they, they have to learn Miss Pac-Man. They have to learn Pac-Man, Galaga, Dig Dug, which Dig, everybody loves Dig Dug. They learn that stuff. That. They learn the stand-up stuff. And then from then, it's just, what do you like? So, but that was when I was a kid. Yeah, that was what, what, what I was into. What When you were younger in your teenage years and stuff, did were you a hardcore game player or was, was, was it something that happened later in life? Uh, it's definitely something that happened earlier in life. And then there was a, a, a long respite. So, um, so my background was sort of like, it's funny you, cause you're talking about you being a good dad or in my opinion, a good dad, but you're teaching your kids, because like one of the things I distinctly remember about uh, playing games during the eight bit and 16 bit era, my first console was the eight bit NES was like, I remember my brother and I asking our father to play with us. And he, he is, and was the greatest father in the world, but he, like was embarrassed to do so. Like, like he did play, but it was kind of like a, a parent going yeah. to a kid's tea party where it was like, he was humoring it. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like, you know, like oh, the, the kids thing. Like it was like the exactly kids. Exactly the same experience. Yeah. experience. Yeah. So like that, did, you know, that, that, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. I've been telling you, I was I had the same experience. My dad would play in television because, and not because it was easy, but it was like battleship battleship on television. You got chips, you, you put your minds down, you can fight. But he liked that. But it was, you know, it's the little disc and one button. And you could just right. hop in and play. He liked that. He liked going and playing Asteroids. We'd play Asteroids at a truck stop or something. He liked that. But Nintendo, the game's much, like, it was ramping up. Right. Like, you had to practice. You had to sit down and, like, to, in order to beat right. Mario, like, you had to put some time in. And I didn't get it when I was a kid. Like, his time was, he's at work all day, and then he comes home and real small bits of time. So he doesn't have the unlimited amount of time to practice but i had the same kind of same kind of thing with my dad yeah and so so my brother and i we uh a lot of this most of my memories from from gaming of the 8-bit 16-bit early childhood gaming memories are with my brother my younger brother uh it was like the one thing that we did together because i was a bad older brother but we uh we got an 8-bit nes um and then and so uh, zelda was probably the game i played the most Mega Man 2 we played a ton uh mario 3 was a favorite game uh it was a very big deal because we had a babysitter we, we felt very cool because we had a babysitter who had uh, lived in Japan. So she had that game like a year before other people and we had the adapter so we could play it. Um, so after it came out, after it premiered in the wizard, we were able to get that early. Oh, um, and then, and then like, you know, the wizard. Like one yeah. in, okay. You know, like <laughs> sort of the, the, the book console wars begins with, against the backdrop of uh, set in 1990 when Nintendo has uh, in America, one in three households in America have an NES. Like it was that, pervasive it was it it. so yeah and so like of course my brother and i wanted a super nintendo because why would we not want the next version or the better version of this thing that we loved and i uh, i'll to this day i always remember my uh father awesome father again like my brother and i gave him like the childhood equivalent of a powerpoint presentation about like you know here's why you should get this for us we'll combine birthdays and hanukkahs and we'll do chores and do all the stuff yeah and, and my dad said that uh, my parents wouldn't get us the Super Nintendo because he said, uh, they quote, you know, Nintendo's just going to come out with a Super Duper Nintendo and then a Super <laughs> Super Duper Nintendo. And like, the obviously, Butcher, Butcher Boy. <laughs> he was correct if you take a very long view. But like, you know, it ultimately, what he was objecting to was what a lot of parents objected to back then was the lack of backward compatibility. And that ultimately is a business decision. And that's kind of like what got me thinking about writing the book console wars because it was like, wow, you know, somebody in a boardroom somewhere and made the decision that it's not worth the extra $35 to have it backwardly compatible. And then as a result, like my parents didn't get that. So we got Sega Genesis, which ended up probably being 
the console that I that was better for me because mostly what I played growing up was sports games. So uh, I played, a, you know, NBA Jam, the Joe Montana football, Madden football. Um, and they, had the, NHL and they, had the, they had the best. I mean, NHL 94 and Sega Genesis. I yeah, mean, it's the best game. That's my favorite game of all time. Phenomenal. Um, and like, phenomenal. it's nice whenever I would interview the EA people um, and I would tell them how much I loved uh, NHL 94 or Madden or, um, you know, Bulls, Blazers stuff. And they would always, the first question would always be, you're playing on the Genesis, right? Because they, it was yeah. so much better on Genesis than Nintendo. Or a lot of them weren't even on Super Nintendo. But, um, and then for, uh, I got a PlayStation and, you know, game day was the game I played the most. And I remember going to software, et cetera, and buying up, uh, I think it was NCAA basketball or college basketball. It was like a uh, college version of NBA Jam sort of thing. And then, uh, and then it, going into high school and throughout college, I didn't play video games um, for many years. Uh, a lot of it was because even this whole time, I always sucked at games. So I always yeah. had more fun watching other people play because yeah. they could actually uh, do stuff yeah. well. There's always a bunch of people stuff. better than me. Yeah, I've been the same way. Like uh, everybody's better. I like it, but everybody's always, you know, there's always guys out there that are right. better. I coalesced for me like I discovered I discovered girls late, and then but the, the, when it happened, then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I need to get a job that like makes a little more money, and then I kind of stayed in video games and worked, and then I worked at electronics boutique because why not? You know, it's good follow up. Yeah, but then I really go to go into college and then just start discovering girls, move out, and then the gameplay mainly just PC stuff. But for you. I don't know when I when I read console wars and you, when we talk about this whole thing in the '90s and this war between these two big companies and there was a lot of dead bodies along the way because you, you know you got Neo Geo, Turbo Graphics 16, uh, how many? I mean, there's tons of other like we mentioned 3DO, oh, yeah. Philips CDI, uh, just endless yeah. other companies that like just barely started trying to fight their way in and were destroyed and Sega, Nintendo, duking it out, battling it out. I mean, it just was brutal. And then eventually Sega just kind of said we're kind of bowed out. Really? After, what, yeah. after, after Dreamcast, I mean, which is behind me, after Dreamcast, they kind of were like, okay, right. we're, we're done. What do you think? Do you think that was a good call for them to just finally kind of say hardware-wise? Because they were so – that's what's funny. The one thing I wanted to talk about and ask you about. So you've got all these companies that come in and then kind of just bow out. You've got Sega that comes in and then bows out after hardware of the Dreamcast, but Microsoft is like their best friend during it, and Microsoft right. tried gaming. They got their feet wet, and then they go and kind of you know do the Xbox, Xbox 360, and just just kind of explode from there. Sony goes to Nintendo, and Nintendo's like, we want to do like they were wanting to do like a CD based Super Nintendo or something. What was that? I, I remember that. And then Sony backs out right. and does their own thing. Just no, kind of back like, out. Or, Nintendo uh, backed out. And yeah, yeah. Nintendo pulled out, and Sony's like, "Okay, well, we'll go do our own thing. Like, it's not that difficult, or it, it's right. it's difficult, but it's, well, they said we'll, we'll just, <laughs> it's not that difficult. Yeah. Just put some stuff together." But it's kind of a recurring theme. You've got these big companies coming in, and then let's carry over into the history of the future. Valve with uh, Oculus at the beginning gets their feet wet, right. pulls back. Hangs out with HTC, does their own thing. It's it's funny the two books they kind of tie together with this one theme of like two companies get together, it doesn't really go, but then the one company says, oh, "Let's do our own thing," and there's huge success in that with lots of dead bodies underneath. Is that does that sound about right, or am I pulling it out of my butt? No, no, that sounds about right. I'm glad that you made a connection between the two books because I definitely felt that connection researching it and writing it. Yeah. And then in a, like the, the simplest way to describe a lot of what you're mentioning is just about the software versus hardware. Um, yeah. You know, like Sega got out of the hardware business, but they're still doing software. Um, and uh, Nintendo still does both. And Oculus and Valve had a, uh, you know, a seemingly perfect peanut butter and jelly relationship until... Oh, yeah. uh, it became a problem because Oculus, you know, I guess I should say to begin with, like from, throughout, you know, Tom Kulinski at Sega or Brendan and Reed at Oculus, Palmer at Oculus, like they, they all know that the hardware is very important and in awesome in both cases. It needs to be awesome, but that's not where the money is. You often lose money on the hardware uh, and you make mm -hmm. your money on the software. So it's, it's hard. Like uh, you, you would ask, do I think that Sega made the right decision to, to exit the hardware business? Um, 
And that's a really hard question. The fact that the Dreamcast was, in my opinion, an awesome console and they lost money on it uh, is a yeah. is shows that there's a business problem there, not a yeah. technical problem. So so maybe yeah. they could have come up with a different solution to that. Um, but but like you know, uh, there's people who make arguments that Nintendo should only be doing software now, and maybe from a bottom line standpoint, that might be better. Though I love the innovations that they bring with their hardware, so it's hard think, to say. I, yeah, I think those conversations happen right when they have when they get kicked down. So after the GameCube right. does not doesn't take over the world, people are like, oh, they should just make games, and then they come out with like the Wii, and then what the Wii U comes out, and everybody's like, oh, you guys should stick to playing games or just do games, and then they follow it up with the Switch. So that's that's. And you see it every time, right? And I, and I think and Nintendo's biggest asset, obviously, is their uh, is their software and their intellectual property. And that's they, and like the fact that they always have that option in their back pocket is what makes them powerful. That you know, in a worst case scenario, they still have Metroid and Mario and Donkey Kong and <laughs> yeah, fifty yeah. million other great titles. Yeah. And that's sort of the problem with Sega is that they have Sonic and they live off of that IP, but they don't have this great library. Uh, to this day of, uh, you know, the, the little the work that they do, they, they put out good games, but they don't have those, like, iconic franchises, which is something that you could help uh, really build and sustain if you're in the hardware yeah. business. And they did That's during the, the earlier years. My kids love the movie. They watched, they probably watched the movie 15 times. And they're not the biggest Sonic fans. I've tried. They're not, they're not the biggest, but the, the, they love them. The Sonic movie is actually really good. It's awesome. Um, so, when you're talking about your research level for the book and you're talking, the only thing I can identify when you're talking about research and getting access to these people and talking to them and interviewing them is for four years, I've done, you know, interviewed people in the VR business and, and made contacts with them and, and, and talked to publicists and, 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 and representatives and, and secret, the secretary that works the front desk and uh, college friends of people and everything else you can imagine and went down roads with, people that and i still have people four years later i still email them and ask them how they're doing and they're right. good kelly bailey he's a sound guy for valve i've talked to him pretty you know on and off four years he'll never do an interview he just doesn't want to and, and that's great he's a genius he does incredible music he, he's done amazing vr games um but i don't care if it takes 15 years i want to talk to him but what's what's your what's this is there a secret is there a formula I, my only thing has been persistence and be nice like that's those are my two just persistence and be nice but is there something yeah that you um can, for, for me for me, don't talk I, to these people so uh, so i never uh you know i must have done a couple thousand interviews overall to date by this point uh and i've never prepared a list of questions in advance. I always just want to have a conversation and see where the conversation goes. And I think that that is uh, often inviting to other people. You know, I kind of approach it like, how would I want to be interviewed? Uh, it's a little, you know, uh, it, if you had a list of questions one by one, uh, uh, I think that'd be less engaging and it would make you make you less active than if you're actually you need yeah. to follow along to everything I say um, yeah. to, to follow up on it or respond to it. Um, being nice. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, my end goal is really just to see the world from the perspective of these different people, because that's what the story is. The story is just different people, usually very intelligent people seeing the same thing differently, like this, Sega and Nintendo seeing their approach differently. There no, they weren't better yeah. people on either side. There were more interesting side. But just seeing like what did they dance. And then uh, it's a lot of, uh, there's a very different process for um, console wars because the story happened in, you know, 19, the book covers 1990, 96 versus uh, the history of the future. And not only just because it was more recent, but also it happened in email era. So there was like so many more records and I ended up getting access to 25,000 emails. So I could, you know, I remember I spent like, I think three yeah. weeks just going day by day through every email and I could actually, follow, I mean, intellectually follow along with everything, but I could at least be aware of everything that was going on. Whereas, you know, with console wars, or even now working on this new book about Larry David and getting to his earlier years, it's a lot harder to, uh, when people, people have a lot of memories of things or opinions of things, but they don't even yeah. know that they have them. So yeah. it, it, you know, having that long term really glasses, important. you know, on, on stuff. Yeah. Cause it's the, the past. That's cool. I didn't, th I, I didn't really think about that with the two books. Console wars is in the past. And this is, for essentially VR right. and history of the future is right now and not that long ago. That's pretty cool. Right. I and I, yeah. That makes it um, 
I mean, I was allowed, you know, the book is more specific um, because I could be, because I had every email record their exact date. And, you know, I, in console wars, there were, you know, the scenes, like there's an author's note that explained that uh, they were recreated scenes. So if someone said like, oh, I remember meeting with this guy and we talked about this, that, that could be a scene in the book. But whereas with the history of the future, because there was, I felt like I could hold it to a higher standard in terms of the specifics, I only wrote as being seen if I knew the exact day it happened and the exact location happened. So there were some great oh, yeah. moments in Oculus couldn't remember the exact day, so I just didn't include it in the book. Um, and uh, so on the one hand, it was uh, it was really nice to have so much more information and such records. I mean, in most, most ways, better. It was a lot more work, but that's fine because I love that work. And they, and they gave uh, you all the, that stuff? Oh, they gave you everything? They were just like, here you go? Like, not they. Like, Oculus or Facebook yeah. definitely didn't want it. But people at the company oh, okay, um, okay, okay. gave it to me. Yeah, that's, I mean, other than that, I kind of get right. the, maybe what we're talking about a bit like, you know, but the difference was when I started console wars after selling the book proposal, um, you know, my initial vision for it changed a lot over the course of writing it, but I put the beginning, middle and end were all the same. Like it was the same right. basic spine to the story for the history of the future. When I started, I had no idea how it was going to end, where it was going to end. And I certainly didn't think it was going to end the way that it ended with founder with Palmer lucky being fired <laughs> for um, the reason that he fired and then all lied about the reasons. And, uh, and, and because I was able, because I was interested in reporting accurately on what happened with his uh, firing and because so many people at Oculus felt really betrayed by Facebook and by the management at Oculus because they were giving false information or no information, yeah. they were much more willing to, uh, uh, you know, uh, share documents with me that maybe they weren't supposed to or whatever. So it ended up being very helpful to me, though I wish there was some, I would have, no, I get very invested in these stories. I would have much rather there been like a happy ending to it than than a dramatic ending. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. When did you, so when did you start on the on the the book writing portion of it where it's going on? You know what I mean? Like you said, the, okay, yeah. So uh, the year that you so, started, so, uh, I, I read it not so long ago. Yeah, so Council Wars came out in uh, May 2014, and oh, yeah. uh, I and read then, pretty re around that. Um, and then the the next year is when I like sold. Uh, I pitched the idea for the book, which was uh, mostly it was mostly just the thinking was that Sega Nintendo, as the subtitle says, defined the generation. Uh, I felt that virtual reality was going to define this decade. I was or the the, uh, the teens. I was very wrong about that, but I. You know, I was thinking like I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know the book was going to be so Oculus focused, in part because I didn't know if I was going to be able to get access to Oculus. Um, yeah. But I started in 2015, so at that point, that was like it was the summer of 2015. So it was like seven months before CV1 actually came out, before the Vive came out. Um, yeah. Like the 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 battle, as it were, was about to happen. And and I, when I was talking to a lot of people, and I think this is pretty clear from the book, like when I first became interested, I assumed that it was like console wars, like all these big companies fighting Sony and Valve and um, and Oculus slash Facebook. But when I talked to the people, that wasn't their experience. A lot of them talked about how collaborative these companies were. Um, and I think that, that comes through in the book. It's less of a battle yeah. between ruling yeah, yeah. rivals. It's about just battling the status quo or battling technical changes or just battling. Because everybody, everybody was an underdog. Palmer Lucky's an underdog. Right. Uh, not not Valve's not an underdog, but what they're trying to do is an underdog. HTC at that point is huge. I mean, every it's like a team of underdog, underdog, underdog. Oh, underdog. Yeah. VR like, is an underdog. Face, that's the thing. It's like VR is an underdog, and yeah, and yeah. I remember uh, like uh, and like it was funny because in the battle between uh, in the battle between Valve and and Oculus, um, you know, since we talked about really the core businesses are software, uh, Valve was the like. The, you know the Goliath. Obviously, they weren't because VR was the underdog. But like, I felt yeah. like it was like Facebook was the underdog, which is so weird because Facebook is one of the biggest companies in the world and yeah. uh, could make an, a good argument they're one of the most unethical companies in the world. Uh, so <laughs> he could, he could definitely make that yeah. argument. <laughs> so, so it was just kind of weird. But again, like uh, you know, also going back to like, what do I do when I interview people? Is like my my, my goal is to see the world from your perspective. So I have a sort of a motto or policy. Like if it's important to you, it's important to me doesn't necessarily mean it'll be in the book, but like, you know, if over the course of this conversation, you mentioned Monkey Island four times, I would be kind of curious, like, okay, what, what is it about Monkey Island? And then I would maybe feel, oh, that was the game you played when you turned 18. Yeah. Like maybe like it, it, figuring out what's important to people and why. 
Um, yeah. And and from Oculus's perspective, they were very much the underdog, um, though someone could make a good case, and and some people did at the time that like they were actually much more like Nintendo because they were controlling uh, of their uh, interface, and and though there were misconceptions, though I would say that uh, it was much more of like Valve's decision than an Oculus decision not to be able to uh, access the Oculus Store from the Vive. But but either way, it was you know Oculus did want to control every aspect of the pipeline, and that's sort of why Facebook had bought them, um, yeah. and and that and that would become a big part of the book too. You know, like I again, like with my grandma in mind, I always want these books to be, um, you know, more about universal stories in the same way that like The West Wing is a political story, but it's really just a story about people collaborating and how you know it takes a team effort to accomplish things and and i was thinking you know in, in a lot of ways this is a story of a startup and of, of starting something together and then what happens when you get acquired and the good that comes from it like the money and the resources and the bad that comes from i mean palmer ended up fired uh yeah. i think that they you know left their original vision um i think that it's you know as much as amazing as the quest is and other products it's still hard to you know trust that their your data is being used the way it's they, yeah, they yeah. say it's being used. Um, yeah. Like yeah. like is there is there pictures and video of my entire house on a Facebook server somewhere? Right. Maybe maybe so like, or, or pictures of like my kid. What are they? Yeah, doing? My kids running around playing Beat Saber, and there's like video of everything. Or my wife walks by probably with not any clothes on because this is a crazy house. Or my kids without you know. There's it's crazy to think. That, that, I I, like, that I'm okay with it. That I'm okay with it. I, I take this thing with cameras on it that's directly connected to Facebook and just, you know, just walk around my house, use it, play video games. It's a little mind. It's a little, if you think about it too much, I don't yeah, want to. It's, it. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot. It's especially uh, difficult to think about because we both obviously love virtual reality. And without Facebook, there would be no industry, not just because of like their investment in Oculus, but like, they are think, taking losses up here and supporting this industry. I think a lot so of like, people forget that. Yeah, a lot of people forget how much money. And I've got, I've, I've dealt with them, or not dealt with them, but I've talked to them quite a bit. And over the years, we have, I mean, we have a good relationship with them. When uh, we went to GDC last year, they invited us in. We went into their little special thing. We got to see the Quest, uh, like the pre-release beta version of Quest, the Rift S. They're super awesome on email. I mean, Jason Rubin's freaking just such a cool guy john carmack i mean how cool is that guy he's like the freaking coolest guy he is and it, probably and the coolest guy the, in the world. If, smartest guy in the world coolest guy in the world jason rubin so freaking cool and that's who we've had you know contact with is is, is mainly with them but then all their their rep people their pr people like everybody at oculus is really cool but one weird thing we're at gdc and of course there's people from facebook there that are not interns, but they're like in their twenties and I don't know, it's San Francisco. So, and when they talk about everything, it was the weirdest thing. This guy was like, he kept saying, Mark, Mark thinks like, we'd ask him a question like, Oh, this, this is, is this going to do be able to do, am I going to put songs on beat saber? Cause they had beat saber there. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is it. This is it. I just knew it. I didn't even want to touch the other rift S. I was like, I put the quest on, I redrew the map and like push the table aside. Cause they had it set up like a fake living room. So I pushed the table out of the way. So I have much room as possible. And I set up my beat saber and I'm playing beat saber. I'm like, I'm not even a journalist. I don't even care. This is amazing. And I'm asking him like, am I going to put songs on this and all this kind of stuff? And, and he keeps answering questions like, well, Mark believes that it's important to like always be open to everything. And Mark would love to have, everything on there but there's licensing things and like that and 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 you know mark wants to do as much as possible i'm like and it, it took me a minute oh he means mark zuckerberg and, and i know that sounds stupid but i was just having a conversation with with rick or uh whatever his name was but yeah it was really weird and every question every question every question felt like it came from a powerpoint and it started with you know mark really wants to make this is accessible for everyone and we're trying to really because we asked price we asked like everything we were asking how much is this going to cost is this going to be a thousand dollars or two hundred dollars is it going to have eye tracking like we were we were going nuts well mark wants to get it in for his it was weird it was a weird bleh, kind of feeling but it was it was <laughs> yeah, fun I mean, like, it's neat but it does get the heebie-jeebies you, you get a little heebie-jeebies like a little kool-aid kind I mean, of thing look, I, I, when you put up the cover of the history of the future i get the heebie-jeebies because it reminds me <laughs> of my bad experiences with facebook cut right oh, in the really? book, so did were they kind of 
a little jerky a little bit i mean they can oh, yeah. they can be uh, they're a big company they're a big company so yeah there's a, there's an author's note at the beginning that just that says that i was basically given like unlimited access to their employees for two years and they abruptly cut it off once they after i caught well, them lying to me about what happened with palmer and that they uh yeah. that i was aware what, of what actually happened you, with him and they were trying to you know massage me in a different direction so they forgot, your, they forgot you were a, a historian and a journalist and an author and, and all those those things. They kind of yes. forget about that stuff. You don't need to. You don't need to, the truth. Well, come on. Right. Yeah, the history. History is what we say it is. Yeah, I. Yeah, that that part. I don't. Like, I, I don't like that about companies. All the companies. Yeah, all the companies. Like everything's going to say is going to be great, right? I'm like no, it 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 won't all be great. If it's not, if it's awesome, I'll say it's awesome. But if it's crappy, right? And part of the problem too is because like. Also, getting back to my style, because I write it like you're in the room with these people, as opposed to a more encyclopedic approach where I would say, you know, per, you know, this person says yeah. this is what happened. Um, yeah. But, you know, I would only write a scene if I have corroboration from the people and I feel yeah. utterly confident that this is how it happened. Um, but yeah. so because they were lying to me about how Palmer was fired and what actually happened, I yeah. realized that they realized that if they had enough people tell me the same lie, and because Palmer, I'm assuming almost with certainty that he was legally not allowed to and is not allowed yeah. to talk to me about what happened because he couldn't tell a different side. If three oh, yeah, people lied to me. Then I was like, India, okay, yeah. well, I have this story from three people, and yeah. I realized that they were basically laundering lies through me through my writing style, and yeah. that's what led to it becoming a problem. And it all came out. That's the that's the crazy thing. Like, what, did they think it wasn't going to come out? Like, that's the crazy thing that they would think that. Oh, no one's ever going to find out. I I. I, I do they? I don't know. That? I feel like I don't, I, I, Mark, I Mark would like I would. it. Mark would. Mark would like it if you just wouldn't talk about that. If you would talk more about Facebook Spaces, Mark would. <laughs> Mark would appreciate right. it if you just mentioned how great Farmville is, or or you know whatever from two thousand. I don't look at a lot of that. It's just like, yeah. you know, for uh, for a company that talks so much and preaches these ethos of like transparency and honesty and the world without. As much you know, the benefit, like Mark used to talk a lot about how the world was going to have less and less privacy, which maybe is true, or maybe something that he's accelerating. But yeah. he, he, it's like a uh, like as as has been portrayed. I don't know if it's true of like WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. It's like no one else should have privacy except for me because I'm the person who's oh, reporting yeah, on it. So like, Mark, Mark I don't like, have a this is I how don't have a Facebook page. Page. <laughs> I'm so, not getting on Facebook. Um, you crazy? <laughs> like that, like uh, you know the way that that Mark coerced Palmer to lie about his politics and the way that Mark, yeah. you know, just never took responsibility for it and they never explained things. And there, and I also yeah. distinguish uh, to me as a journalist, and I'm sure it's similar with you. Like I, I make, there's a big difference between spin, which can be very heavy, you know, like you could say, you could say, you know what, virtual boy was very successful. And that wouldn't totally be a lie because maybe your parameters for what is successful are different. It sold but more than actually, a dozen. Yeah, like you could say it sold more than something that's made. But like, the, there's, so sold that's more than any other virtual reality headset. Yeah, and then, there, and then, but then I was outright being lied to about what happened, and that's very different to me. That's that's really unethical. Did and, he? Did you uh, reach out to him after it happened and be like, "Hey, man, what's going on?" Like, I, I, your Palmer? emails are getting returned, or yeah, or he couldn't say anything. I mean, but he, I, he, he talk off the record and be like, "Hey, man, you won't believe this shit." No, no, he couldn't talk off the record. Um, no. He still can't why he can't talk but i'm like i said i'm pretty certain it's because of legal things he signed um i i, I talked to him almost every day when writing the book i just couldn't talk yeah. to him about topics like yeah. hey man how you're uh not like in your office for three months so i like <laughs> i knew that he Where you been, buddy? yeah yeah talking to him every but he but i couldn't when i said like oh why'd you write a post saying you like gary johnson i thought you like trump he could he said about oh, you know i can't talk about that kind of stuff so there, um so I couldn't get that information from him, and I really appreciated other people at Facebook mm. who had different political views than Palmer. I really felt that what happened was unfair, and they stepped up and they got me the information I needed so that I could publish what actually happened. But anyway, who who would have thought that a VR book would become a book about politics? Because that was, and it, well, it's sort of like, yeah, yeah, it's it like that's the how whole Palmer thing. Too. The whole thing was crazy. The whole thing really was crazy, and and you know everybody has. Everybody has different views and like it's it's 2020 like this corona everything I don't think anybody saw no one I mean well people from New York could tell you 
<laughs> what was going to happen. <laughs> that was the only thing. Like, if you ask somebody from New York, like, how is this guy? How do you think it's going to be? They'll be like, oh, it's not going to be good. Like, we've been on this guy a long time. But besides yeah, that, I'm, I'm from Trump's not a yeah, very yeah. popular guy. No, no, because because you've been you've his antics have been going on for a long time. Like this is not new. Like, like his dad, like same kind of antics, whatever. But yeah, they can tell you what was gonna gonna happen. But everybody else kind of was like, oh, we didn't we didn't know what was gonna happen. But um, what's funny? I don't know. It's from a business. If I just put my business hat on, and I said I was gonna support both sides, because they often do that. They'll give money to both sides. And shake hands right. and meet in back rooms and drink drinks and be like, you guys are the best. Hope you win it. And then go to the same an hour later. You guys are the best. Hope you win it. Like I, we know that goes down. They don't just back one. Well, horse. I mean, aside from like the, the, uh, the sliminess to the way you described it, where it's like yeah. everyone thinks that they're making, they're being treated genuinely. Like, I mean, like what you're describing is like called tolerance where you actually are yeah. like, Hey, I, I yeah. don't agree with you, but it's fine. Yeah. You know, I'm going to support your campaign because I know other people do. And that was, that was what really yeah, was yeah. so eye opening to me about what happened with Palmer and Facebook was that look, half the country or almost half the country voted for Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I definitely didn't. And I don't agree with those people who did, but like to pretend like that is wrong and that anyone who did did so for the worst reasons possible and needs to be punished. Yeah. That's crazy. Especially at a yeah. company as big as Facebook and a, mm -hmm. especially uh, to take that out on a person as uh valuable as Palmer, you know, uh, part of the Facebook narrative that they tried to sell me was that like Palmer was so useless at that point in time. So, you know, his firing had nothing to do with politics. It was because he, 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 you know, he was such an insignificant person. Well, you know, he's since a company that's worth almost as much already. So like maybe, yeah. maybe he's a smart. smart. He's a, he's a ridiculously yeah. smart. Uh, you go into it in your yeah. book. Like he's, his, his, like the whole RV thing and the, and, and it's, there's there's a whole experience with 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 VR that is in an RV and it's all inspired by his old RV. Oh, right. just, yeah, yeah, it was in his parents' driveway. Man, it's such a cool oh, part right. of the book and, and 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 so neat. But like you talk about somebody that they're they're just chilling in their RV and their parents like working on stuff, reaching out to John Carmack, just making all sorts of crazy prototypes, just constantly hammering away, going online, doing all the research like finding everything possible about vr iterating it really having a focused idea for how it's going to be in the future then push 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 yeah that narrative of saying that he was useless is it, it would be the equivalent i think of right after the ipad coming out going all right steve thanks for everything yeah. see you later yeah, it, yeah. It, it's insane it kind like of what they did before when they pushed him out the first time but it's it's the similar and i know that in in it or in uh, the tech sector, and, and especially in California, and that whole thing, there's a million stories. Guy founds the company, they kick the guy out, and it works right. out great because then the real businessmen come in and do that. But the his vision and right. his drive, it's but the it's point crazy. is like there, there maybe 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 he no longer there's a world where maybe he would have been pushed out for people with different visions or whatever. And I could put in you know on paper I can believe that, but but the reality is that. If he were not a Trump supporter, if he actually were a Gary Johnson supporter, he would still have his job, or at least he would have yeah. still had his job. I, I don't know how things would have played out, and and yeah. so it really was that, you know, that is political. That is discrimination. When when I I think he would have bumped heads. I didn't. I didn't a bunch of them, and I uh, left once. Facebook kind of went to Lenovo for the Rift S and said, "We want like cheaper. We want to take a step back. We want cheaper. We want easier to set up." Right. And a lot of the people at Facebook, higher ups, were like, "No, no, that's not where we're going. We want to go forward, forward, forward." And Facebook's like, "Well, we want to sell a bunch of these things, so we're going to do Rift S and we're going to do Quest." And and they got right. I, not I that they got he, they got to get lucky on the the quest the quest because the quest is a, is pretty amazing. But to I don't know, yeah, they kind of went. Well, back yeah, I, I talked because I would talk to him almost every day, so I. Before all this happened, I asked him what he thought his future plans were. Did he was he planning to stay after his, you know, uh, options vested? It was you know because like, a lot of people, like you said, left like Brandon and Nate and Mike yeah. Antonov and so many others. Um, Carmack left, um, and Palmer in his ideal world he wanted to stay at Oculus forever, but also start to then do other things, sort of like Elon yeah. Musk, you know, mm -hmm. on wears different hats. And, you know, basically he w wouldn't do it behind Facebook's back, but like have some sort of yeah. honorary role or some sort of role at Facebook slash Oculus for the rest of his life. So he smart. was a lifer and cause yeah, that's yeah. what he would have wanted. 
So you I think he'll come back? In there. Do you think he's gonna like? He'll he'll dip dip back in and go in and like. There'll be some startup company out there that has like the coolest AR headset or like has like that next VR headset that has like no screen door, like crazy resolution, field of view, really light. Probably make it for hundred bucks. Like and him go okay. Here's tw- here's ten million dollars. Let's do this. Or do you know what I mean? You think he's gonna come back or no? I th- I, th- I could I wouldn't I could, I could see that scenario. I think that like you know he yeah. he said this publicly during his time, and I think it conveys to the book like uh, as much as he is a showman and very charismatic and you know like he's on magazine covers so people think that he likes to be the center of attention he does like to be the center of attention but yeah he he has a very practical philosophy where it's like if i can't be a value to something i don't want to be here so i think that if there was an ar headset that could be successful with his 10 million dollars and he thought that was important he wouldn't be afraid to step in and do it or if there's something that he could actually do technically he wouldn't be afraid to do it uh, but i think that if if, other, if it's going to happen without him he's not going to then try to get in just to get in on this new space yeah, race i think that fun. he actually wants to um o- offer his whatever asset he has whether it's his yeah. intellect or his body in a way to help things that wouldn't happen otherwise and then you see that with this new company too which again mm-hmm. is a you know a defense technology company some people might disagree with some of that they've done totally fair what they're doing would not be getting done if not for them. So yeah. it's at least he's yeah. and for people who don't know, he's got a military and it's it, like, is it drones and like maybe a virtual wall versus like a physical one, which I think is the dumbest thing right. ever, but like, like a virtual drone wall, robotics, AI assisted technology, that kind of stuff. But for the military, for the right. government. Yeah. 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 I, the, their first, the first project that was reported on and that was known was they work with, uh, the border protection agency you said like uh, using these, um, a virtual border to me i thought it was like a very non-political win because prior to yeah. trump's rhetoric which i largely yeah, yeah. disagree with we, you know, uh, most americans myself included care, uh, thought we should have secure borders i just thought spending a lot of money on a physical wall is a very idiotic way to do it and yeah they came up yeah. with a solution that is much cheaper for us taxpayers and, and you don't get it you get a sawzall with a diamond bit blade and go right up and just drain. Just, it's done. The little right. poles fall over. You, you, that's it. You just defeated this trillion dollar wall, whatever, uh, or a big ladder. <laughs> it's like ladder technology's right. come a long way, uh, but a drone right. with like night vision and infrared and can see underground and can hear shit. I'm sorry, that's a better idea. I mean, if you want to secure a border, I think that's way better idea. And somebody in VR probably piloting the thing and, and ai systems and all that stuff it's a lot smarter and a lot smarter like uh like i said earlier they are almost or maybe already have surpassed the value that oculus sold to facebook for almost three billion dollars like they're you know a unicorn company and they've done so well and some people have like been you know a lot of people are surprised that they've been so successful so quickly and part of it is because they've just identified a need that no one else in the tech industry is really looking at and then you see that again you kind of figured it out yeah 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 big companies don't want to touch it you know like palmer and his co-founder trey stevens wrote like a letter uh, an op-ed in the washington post that's included in the upper they are the the brightest minds out there in the tech companies to help make our country safer um which has historically been something in the United States that that companies and people have been proud to do, but people feel, uh, you know, a percentage of people feel strongly about, uh, you know, disagree with some of the U.S. foreign or militaristic policies, and uh, seemingly a huge percentage of those people work in the tech industry and have, you know, gotten Google and Microsoft and these other companies to not to not take defense contracts. So that's just been yeah, a, yeah, a exactly. real win. It's yeah, yeah, it's like more more going to them. And the other thing is that I think maybe to keep this back on VR. You know, the military kind of kept VR going for a long time. Like the military with battle training and all that kind of stuff. And I've talked to friends of mine in the, that are in the Air Force that are pilots and stuff. And what they have is very antiquated. And and when they would come to my house and play, even the original Vibe, they're like, this is 10, 20 years beyond what they have me using to to do for right. flight training and stuff. And then talking to guys that are um, army and have been down in the desert and stuff. And their training, they're like AR training and stuff like that. It's very crude. And and the base I lived near in Germany, they had a, a battle area. I never got to visit it, but they had a battle area with like a really crude VR in like 2005, 2006. But 
the military and the government has been paying the VR bill probably since the late nineties, I would say, uh, and keeping it going, making these little companies. But one of my favorite moments in the story, and it's in the book, is when yeah. uh, Brendan Reeve and Joe Chen, uh, who's an early Oculus employee, went to the ITSEC, uh, the military conference in Florida in 2012. Yeah. The general tries the headset, and uh, Joe Chen yeah. gives him a demo and he asks how much it costs, and Joe says 300 yeah. meaning $300. Oh. And the general like, kind yeah. of interested, but he thinks it's a little expensive. He wants, and then he sort of implies like maybe it could be done for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and Joe's like, no, no, no it's three. <laughs> I know he was like three hundred, you know, right about three hundred, maybe a little under, and he's like, uh, could it be two hundred eighty thousand, two hundred seventy. Yeah. I could do two fifty. I do a quarter of a million. <laughs> and I, that shows exactly like how big, because you know you can try DK one now or what, and like you know it's hard to think like this was really such a big breakthrough, but it was that that was like yeah, so much yeah. different than yeah, the military was, is spending. Oh. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I work. I worked for the federal government, and the the money they would blow out their butt is, is shocking. Shocking how much money. I, I tell tons of stories from people about like just crazy amounts of money they would just, just like million dollars, two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand on just the just crazy stuff, or just lose stuff that we'd have stuff shipped down to the desert. My wife was an instructional. Uh, ran instructional programs and she had like a $150,000 mat for gymnastics got shipped instead of getting shipped to Germany. It got shipped to like, I think it was like uh, Bagram. So they sent her down there to look for it. And eventually she's just like, it's not here. It's somewhere. It's probably, it's probably in somebody's house <laughs> Buy another one Buy two, just in case. I mean, it was, there's so many stories of how much money they blow out their butt. But that, uh, man, I love that story. That's I remember that right as I was saying that. That, but there's a that's the funny thing. You're talking about scratching the surface. That's one out of so many cool stories in the book, and then right. so many yeah. things that we don't even know about or that weren't didn't even have time for it. Um, you mentioned are is either console wars or is there? Did you like a documentary or is this? It should be on Netflix. Console wars should be on Netflix, and. History of the Future needs to be on Netflix or Hulu. But is there any kind of yeah, plans for that? So, so the Council Wars, the book, uh, is being adapted into a, a, a TV series by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg and Scott Rudin for CBS All Access. Um, Freaking awesome. So not Netflix, but CBS All Access. Uh, they've been awesome. very good to work with. And, uh, and then in addition to that, CBS All Access and the Legendary Pictures, who's also involved with the TV yeah. series and has really been like the guiding force behind it, they're all, they uh, they produced the documentary that I co-directed with Jonah, who I mentioned earlier from the Dictator yeah. script, and uh, and so that was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest before COVID, oh, so wow. that's done. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know when it's it, gonna come out, but that, but it's done. The doc, the documentary of Cons the Cons Wars documentary. Amazing, dude. Yeah, I I, I think yeah. it's. It's such a cool story, and it's so well. I mean, this is a perfect time to release it on on. I'd, I'd subscribe to CBS and Alexis to watch that in a heartbeat. Well, um, that you'll that action pretty soon, but yeah, I mean, it's like yeah, yeah. again, like I, I just feel very lucky to be the custodian of these awesome stories. Yeah. Um, you know, it takes a while to find the best ones and to plot them all together, but like ultimately, it's these great stories and these great characters that make these books so fun. So having these people tell the stories in their own words over the course of 90 yeah. minutes is, is, is great. Um, Have you ever been to South by Southwest? No, I haven't. I've I was very excited it. to go. Yeah, I, I've seen... I want, I'm going to go someday. I'm definitely going to go. I, I saw an interview with Ernie Klein and he was talking about going. He was talking about going and then like his movie premiering from his book that I, I think he was at it maybe with his book years prior or something, but he was talking about being at it and he was being real detailed about uh, his movie premiere and just being at South by Southwest and just people, cause that is a movie to take to South by Southwest. I mean, people are just going ape shit for it cause it's, you know, it's phenomenal, but yeah, that, I mean, that sucks, man. But you know what? Okay. COVID happened. I yeah. get it. It happened. Uh, definitely, uh, stuck at home. It's so. Much, there will be more. There will be, more. be a lot worse. Uh, I'm yes. glad that I have a good movie, and I'm just yeah. very fortunate that you know to have good health. And so, yeah. I'm, I'm not crying about that. But uh, yeah. we'll figure the, it out when it comes. first world problems. 
Yeah. Um, how did how did the relationship with Seth Rogen and, and his production company? Because man, he does some incredible. Uh, check everybody out there watching. Check Seth Rogen's IMDb page for like things he produces and things he picks because yeah. he just is just picks the coolest shit to do. But how did that relation? How did that come together? Uh, sure. So I I need to go in like ten minutes. If, if okay. No. No. Me too. Me okay. as well. My wife's pinging me. Okay. But yeah. So uh, so you know one of the best parts selfishly for writing both of these books is that they're like as much as they should feel like exciting adventurous stories they are like big case studies like what oculus mm -hmm. did was incredible and what sega did was incredible and what nintendo did was incredible and so i get to learn from sort of these business tips from what they did and one of the things that sega did was identify that they were a nobody in the game industry just like i was nobody as an author and they aligned themselves with celebrities and with talents much greater than themselves and so early on i wanted to try to get a film version or a tv version going and I definitely did not think that I'd ever hear back from Seth Rogen. I had no prior relationship with him, but I had my manager send him like a, a treatment of, my, of what the book was at that time. And I met with him and, uh, and him and Evan were interested and, you know, we've been working on it together since 2012. So the project's been going on for a very long time. Um, but like you said, like he, he gets behind, he, by the end of that day, him and Evan wanted to be behind the project and they've been, they know, good material. And, they know good yeah. material and, and you have, you brought good stuff. Like about our, yeah. Yeah. And, and the book, when the, and I think if anybody's watching, like in screenwriting, they do what's the page 10 moment, right? Because there's so many, so many Hollywood producers, they'll read 10 pages in. And if there's not something, they're just like, next one. And your right. books, both within the first 10 pages, 20 pages, and it's easy, it gets to be 100 pages. It's just like you're, you're in, you're hooked, you're, you're reading it, you're Thanks, like, man. I want to. I want to. I, I, I want to see what the next crazy story is about. You know, the companies that we knew, like especially console wars, but then things that. Yeah, it's really really cool, and and man, I wish we had four more hours because I wanted to start talking about classic arcade games and. Well, I'll come on well, and, that. And, and so many other characters, but well, for another time, another time. But if some one, if you could give your email address again for all those, you're going to get so many like crap scripts and stuff, but. But but people that have questions, I guess all scripts are crappy the first time you write them. But oh, I would also email. Would recommend don't send something the first time. Reach out and maybe try to start a dialogue, and then then send your ninth send, send your ninth draft. Don't send oh, your first. Well, I send your ninth. Just send a script you send. Here's what I wrote about. Can I send you it? That's yeah yeah yeah. Uh, uh, but if someone wants to reach out to you, what's the best? What's the best way for them to get? Uh, there's a, there's an email on my website blakejharris.com it's uh okay. info at blakejharris.com but yeah you can find I may, that, I may, there. that may be how i did yeah, that's i think, what you, I think that's what i did that's what i did and yeah. probably not a well-worded email but um so it, it, was, it was dad jokes i'm sure and sorry i didn't get as many dad jokes uh i'll work yeah. more on some more dad jokes i apologize um yeah but thank you so much man this has been probably my best interview i've ever done definitely the coolest uh, I love the books. I absolutely love the books. And I want to tell everybody out there, I want to get my little thing on here. The first one is Console Wars. That is just such a cool book. If you've ever played a video game or your grandmother, this is what you want to read. And then two, if you have really, if you want to know about business, because these are these books are about how how business we think they work and then how they actually work and how crazy it can be and how anything can happen. So that's the big thing, but I want to say, Blake, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for supporting the show. And hey, man, awesome. I I, I just can't say uh, how lucky we are to it. hear these stories and hear stuff. And yeah, I, I yeah, just thank you so much. My pleasure. And everybody, uh, you as well. And everybody, uh, we're going to do lots more interviews. If you wanted to email me, it's Damon at everythingvirtual.net. Uh, the show goes out on every kind of media. It's on audio, uh, Spotify, everything's out there. Anchor is a good place to go see it, but then we're on YouTube here. But please reach out to us if you have any questions or want to, what you want to see or somebody you want to talk to, uh, people you want to hear from, let us know. All right, everybody. Bye. Bye.